Wow. Good, good, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Let's Talk Board Games, episode number 17. Crikey. We're, we're on a roll, quite literally, guys. <laughs> it's an absolutely mental uh, month uh, you know, with everything that's been going on over here at Dave Lincoln Geek. And tonight, I'm uh, really excited to have uh, my fellow co host, Gregor. Hello, everyone. Uh, I've got Dino Girl. Hey. And uh, of course, myself, Mr. Hey. Chris. Uh, Mr. Giorgio has excused himself tonight, everyone, and he's taking the night off, and I don't actually blame him. <laughs> he's still recovering uh, from the COVID, isn't he? Uh, and he? He didn't have the COVID, thankfully. He had just a cough, which is what we all prefer him to have rather than <laughs> have COVID. It's not a nice thing. And, of course, <laughs> also, I'd like to welcome oh, our yeah. guest, Stephen from Bernard Forge Games. Hello. Hey, great to see everyone. It's wonderful to meet you live through the interwebs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pleasure. So, yeah, so uh, we're going to be um, basically talking to you about your, your new game that's going to be coming to Kickstarter, right? Isn't it? It's going to be coming uh, in the coming months, um, Slash and Spells. Um, oh, yeah. It's, it, how long mm -hmm. have you been developing this, dare I ask? Uh, yeah, um, maybe I could uh, just start with the origin story to tell you how long. <laughs> I think about three years now. Uh, wow. And I came up with the idea to want to make a board game five years ago and then and sat on it. I made like a little very dinky stolen art prototype uh, that no one knew about that I never was going to make into a real game. Just, uh, you know, I had some friends over and we would have board game nights and one time i was like you know it'd be cool if we just had like a you know combat game where we could just join an arena sort of thing and just fight so i just threw together some some characters and they were very very much like uh very simple versions of what we've created today uh, i started developing the real game i had an old boss uh and he let me know he's like you know you know kickstarter these board game companies are launching and you can you know create your own company and people will support you online they do pretty good you can make these games and i didn't even know it was possible that you could launch board games on kickstarter and he he was an enthusiast and he showed me all his he had nemesis he just got nemesis at the time i think and he was, he was geeking out on it and i was like oh my god i did a million on kickstarter so he's like yeah even the modest indie creators <laughs> can still launch their games and so i was like hey I, I made something and he goes you should you should try to make it into a real board game and that that started down the the journey of me me just doing this as like a passion project on the side you know i would get off my job and start working on things and talking to people and attending some local you know uh bay area based designer and, and protospiel events uh so we had mm -hmm. designer nights uh you know john breger was apparently hosting one and i uh, reached out to him uh he had just you know taken on a full-time game uh design position and had been hosting these nights and that's how Actually, how I got into the space started kind of being around actual designers, and you know they were very kind to me when I was first just learning how to do this, because uh, there was a lot of uh, a lot of things about the game at the time that significantly changed as I got better as a designer, and then that actually mm -hmm. kind of leads into uh, how I met. My co-designer Floyd Liu, he you know had been publishing games in the past, and so oftentimes uh, he was at these events that John was at as well, and that's how I met him. Fantastic. So what were you doing when you say your boss like mm -hmm. was like an enthusiast? What were you doing beforehand? Was it related to board games or? Yeah, not at all. So completely outside of the industry, uh, you know, I had been working in logistics, uh, selling uh, logistics software. So, you know, USPS, uh, you, know, um, you name it at the time. Um, that's where I was working, just helping uh, e-commerce brands and, and, and clients leverage logistics and do that shipping aspect of it. So it was completely unrelated. Uh, it just so happened that my boss at the time was extremely passionate about board games and kind of, I've heard of Kickstarter, but I just didn't go on the platform. I didn't see that there was this wonderful community of board gamers who were super pa passionate uh, and that there was a side community of all these uh, Facebook groups with, you know, developers and, you know, play testers and all that. At. So it was completely for me. Um, so it was kind of an awesome surprise that I kind of stumbled into it. 
Yeah, we're, we're actually like quite huge fans of Kickstarter. Um, I think everybody within the Diary of a Lincoln Geek team has supported projects on Kickstarters. Um, quite a few of our other um, live show guest stars have, have started out on Kickstarter. So um, I just got my copy of Playful Pets by Attakin Games. Um, and she's very small business. She does everything all of herself. She very cool. builds them all herself. And she 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 launches through Kickstarter and has had some really successful campaigns. So um, so yeah. No, if if you're going to get into like making your board game a reality and you just don't have like the the disposable income to do it, but you've got the idea and you've got the premise, Kickstarter is a fantastic really controlled way of of um of arranging that so i'm so glad that you found kickstarter because um you know we're, we're, we're big supporters quite a lot of the games i've got have come through the kickstarter platform but it's not just for small businesses either like a lot of biz, big businesses pandasaurus yeah. games is quite a big company and they've just released um dinosaur world through kickstarter so um that that arrived recently as well <laughs> so, yeah it's yeah. almost become huge, like huge it fans. is the advertising platform <laughs> for board games. crazy unless you're like yeah. a major manufacturer like that is it really is, is. The place to... yeah i mean and, and this is not... i know it's it's, it's, it's wonderful to see how the space is just sorry carol go ahead sorry chris no no it's all right it's, i was gonna say um, it, it's just wonderful because um <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm out here in the US. And so there's a little bit of a delay between the things I think. Um, you know, it's not the world's best internet where I am at right now. Um, so you know, I was saying, um, it, it's great to see other indie creators. And part of the wonderful thing with working with a co designer that published before is I, you know, have an understanding of how a business works, and run it as best as I possibly can to you know deliver the most value to bears but the, the best part i think is the supportive community that's there all the other fellow designers that have gone through this process been battle tested you know refer back to like myself and basically assist in that process for getting things ready for what that's going to look like and that's really special about you know the journey through all this <laughs> yeah no it, it is it is a journey and lots of uh community you know designers out there uh you know are doing that these days um we would we literally just did a, a podcast recording uh just the other day with a nottinghamshire based designer here um he does seminars uh, and but still utilizes uh, kickstarter for his games and he has a board game design background it's it's a very acceptable way of coming up with your games um uh, one thing I kind of wanted to lead on with that with yourself is um, what's been one of the the, uh, the major pro for, for Kickstarter for you and what's been a major mm -hmm. con for Kickstarter for you? Um, okay, I think for, for Kickstarter, uh, pro would be that they're an established company that, that you know, the process, um, <clears throat> thing up the page and everything is quite reasonable. I haven't run into any challenges there. Um, uh, they're going to manage a lot of pieces of it. And then, you know, obviously working with a you know, after, you know, backing backer kit type scenario where, you know, you do the logistics and everything is something that, that we're planning through. But for Carter itself, it's just the community around it is the number one pro, I think, um, hands down. Just the, the people who are willing to give you feedback when you're doing development and design and play thing, uh, the, the people who are willing to, you know, talk shop with you, other designers. That's really where I think Kickstarter's, you know, doing a great job. You know, GameFound might give them a, a bit of a run for the money. If we look back, you know, five years from now, where we might be, it might be neck and neck, they're the same thing, but slightly different. Uh, it seems like they've come up pretty quickly. Um, so I guess the, the con for Kickstarter would be that they finally have a competitor. Uh, I don't think they ever had a competitor before. No one was doing what they were doing. Indiegogo, my understanding is, like, if you look at all the board game campaigns in Indiegogo, it's not at all. <laughs> so I think that the con for Kickstarter is that there wasn't a competitor, and now there is. So then now they have to both elevate. Uh, and then the mm -hmm. other con for Kickstarter is, unfortunately, they take fees. I think that's the only real issue I have. I mean, the service is great, uh, but <laughs> obviously they take a percentage of everything so uh, you know that that'll be the only con i can think of <laughs> yeah. 
Now, now that you've found out about Kickstarter and being a board game enthusiast, have you fallen into the same trap that most of the Dorover Lincoln Geek team have, which is you're constantly on there going, oh, I must back this game and oh, I must have a copy of this game. Are there, are there any um, games that you've seen as you've been um, using Kickstarter that you thought, I have to have that? Have you seen it more as a buying platform for yourself now than you ever um, thought you might? Oh yeah, I have to. Uh, I have to talk myself out of things all the time because um, there's there's too many good games, um, and that's not a bad problem. I mean, it's just a bad problem for your wallet. <laughs> Is you know, there's so many awesome things that like I would love to try, uh, but I just don't have the time uh, or the money to to back every. But you know, there are so many great projects. I think one of them uh, for me that was a uh, an insta back was uh dwellings of eldervale um just because i knew luke and you know i had play tested a, an early version of it and you know i'm not a huge euro gamer i'm just kind of getting into this space uh, and that was one of the first ones that kind of checked all the boxes for me i'm designing a fantasy combat game so uh that's kind of the realm i like to live in i, I love fantasy and i love sci-fi um so he was designing a fantasy euro game uh, that was very much like, you know, I wouldn't say Lord of the Rings because their art style is completely different, but he's got orcs and he's got elves and he's got cool races and things like that. And that's kind of what I'm saying is that stuff always appeals to me. Um, mm -hmm. But there's been um, a, a couple games that I just recently saw on Kickstarter that I had to, uh, you know, back off on but you know a lot of indie diverse I, I try to back as many indie games for designers that i know and i've play tested their games uh just because i want to be supportive to the community that you know has brought me here uh you know so quest and cannons um uh, cleos a few other different indie designer games um uh, token terrors and many many more there's there's tons more besides that um that i'll continue to back as they go to kickstarter um, just because, you know, I, I support the, the creators of the projects and, you know, want to, you know, help them succeed. Mm. One I of mean, the I, things I, I, I really love about Kickstarter is you can, there are options within the pledge managers for a lot of them to just back the game to show your support. So you don't actually ask, you don't actually have to buy a copy. You can donate a dollar or five dollars, um, just to show your support for the project to help yep. them push it through and i've done quite a lot of kickstarter projects like that where i've not actually bought the game because i'm running out of space and my husband watches me on these things and he knows how much i'm spending um, <laughs> <laughs> but I just that it, it's a very inclusive community and you can support each other so even if you can't afford to buy the game right now you can show your support to them um, exactly. A lot of them have like late pledge managers where you can um, join the pledge a bit later. So if you donate a dollar now, then, you know, you can reassess at the end of the campaign when the pledge manager opens to, to... Yeah. it makes it so much easier for you to budget for them. I'm saying this because I've got a lot of games, like a lot well, this, coming. This is the thing. <laughs> I do exactly the same thing. As <laughs> I mean, um, I, you know, I've backed probably 30 games in the last year, but I've probably only bought four of them. But I've, I've, I've been inspired by the project um, and, and, you know, it's wanted me to go, you know what, you know, I, mm. I may not want a copy of the game, but, you know, the, these guys deserve it uh, and, and we've all done it. But then, like Steph's just said, I, at a later date, I've upgraded the pledge because I've gone, you know what, I actually mm. want a real a, a copy of the game. And, and one of those games was, was Snapshot by Paperboat Games. But originally, we were only going to get one of us in the diary of Lincoln Geek team was only going to get one copy of it because normally we we all back so many different things. We were like, okay, we're not going to get it. Mm -hmm. But it was so good. We loved it so much uh, that we all ended up just backing it and all got our own copies. <laughs> that, that nobody wanted to fight me for the review copy. So yeah, yeah, that too. <laughs> That too. <laughs> I mean, we've at the moment on screen we've got we've got the Kickstarter awesome. pre-launch page. Uh, up on screen so people can can go on and have a look at that if they like the look of it. Um, what I am going to quickly just do, bring on screen, is so everyone can see it, and much bigger is the is the Slash and Spell, Slash and Spell games. I mean, um, 
the the standees really kind of stand out on me and the graphics look amazing but tell us about the game uh, you know uh, uh, you know how how yeah you know, elements of the you know the core mechanics that that were really kind of stand out and make this you know different from everything else so i'll just say this what what the feel you're trying to capture with this game is something that you can take on to the table and there's a level of complexity uh and fun that will be had by all players so we wanted something that was you know easy to pick up the core systems we built aren't too complicated uh but that they have juicy and complex details in underneath each different essentially it's an arena combat game for two to four players uh, we call it a hero building battleground and as you go through and play the of different ways your hero will be growing and scaling so they'll be increasing in damage and as you move through the game uh the system that drives play so you're going to be taking one of six basic actions that are shared by all the heroes and that's going to to drive your movement ability to gain energy which allows you to play cards what's super unique and interesting about the game is the map is very what goes on in play everything corresponds to both the map as well as you're going to be fighting over knockdowns so there's no player elimination system there's a knockdown system and that's actually the objective of the game is to score as many knockdowns as you possibly can uh, uh, once you uh, reach the final round, all the knockdowns are tallied and a winner is declared. Uh, to get those knockdowns, there's a variety of different cool things that we've put into the game to make it fun. Uh, so it's basically hex based on a 19 hex uh, map. We created like a living world style because uh, I felt that a lot of arena combat games don't really tie into a world when you're fighting on and I wanted to kind of create that element that this is a living, breathing world with, with real fantasy characters characters on it. Uh, but essentially, you move around uh, using your action selection, play cards from your hands, uh, and then drive the hero growth by picking up magical relics. Uh, on the board, you'll notice there's a bunch of cubes, uh, you know, various different colors. So there's red, blue, and yellow. And the blue stands for relics of control. The red stands for relics of power. And the yellow stands for relics of growth a lot of time uh, building these completely unique asymmetrical heroes. I mean, if I could drive one thing forward about this game, well, battle game. So if you if you like battling and you like asymmetrical heroes, this is going to be a good fit for you uh, because it is the, the character development. I think that's really where we spent a lot of time is building these completely unique asymmetrical characters own tech tree uh, or skill tree for each one with three different relic paths that you can go into. Uh, uh, and they have various different bonuses you get when you unlock the relics. So as you move around the map, there's various random relics placed all over. So each time you play, there's a ton of replayability because bases. Um, you're going to be competing for certain colors because you want to unlock certain abilities. Uh, you also have a hero skill sheet. Uh, ability possible with this game we don't want you know players of all sorts of, of types of uh ability level to feel like characters that have a lower difficulty level uh like beginning characters uh characters that are like average or, or easy to play and you could still if you're this ones and still play them no problem and then characters with higher difficulty levels so that once you play some of these earlier characters if you want some we got something for you as well. Uh, so we have, you know, six different characters, too easy, too medium, and too hard would be the easiest ones because they all share the same systems, but how that actually functions is completely different. So for Kotoko the Nightblade, she's one of our, you know, because she doesn't have any tokens that she has to manage or control. So we've eliminated the tokens for her because those are, you know, three unique different powerful tokens uh, for other characters. And so that's more things that you have to think about. Well, for her, she's just got 18 unique cards. All the characters have 
18 cards of unique art and effects uh, for each character. What's super special about our card play that ties into everything as well is at the bottom of each card um, is actually an action selection. Um, so yeah, in that photo there that you're hovering over, it, it doesn't really show exactly what I'm referring to, but if you look, look at the uh, card in her uh, trash pile, um, sorry, there. maybe I'll, uh, I'll just go back. So each card has an action slot. So you can action select the cards you play and build a custom row of action selection. So you'll have your six basic, and then you'll actually slot those cards in to three unique hero slots underneath each player board so that you can actually take these special ability actions that actually evolve during play and it's very thematic and fun because now your six basic actions can be extended with hero specific unique actions as well as when you play the card you get to take all those unique actions and a base attack damage that's included um so all that intertwines basically in this game so that gives you a lot of replayability as well question? then because based saw... on the cards that you pick will allow you to then like a play the same character but in a different way and change the tactic based on who you're playing and who the other players are on the board. I quite like that. Mm. Yes. Yeah. It's um, So I guess if we think about it, we really did want to have deep replayability. And that was one of the things that we designed. So with the asymmetric heroes, because you choose your path, some, some games it's going to be very hard to go down uh, one path. You could still choose to do it and it may pay off. Uh, because we have a very intricate system that's balanced, but you know there are optimal choices presented at, at, at times. And what's fun as a player is when the first time you play it, there's a lot under the hood here. And so you're mostly just trying to you know do the core objective, which is I'm gonna try to take you down, I'm trying to knock you down, reduce your health to zero, scores a knockdown, and you're gonna go to recovery. So you basically get knocked down and you go to a corner of the map you get removed from the board. No one can damage you anymore. Uh, you gain some energy because uh, you're recovering out in the out in the the desert to come back and enact your vengeance later. And then when you actually come <laughs> back, you're going to draft a zone token. Uh, so no one knows where you're coming back because you're out for vengeance, right? So you're going to draft a random zone token between one and four zones, uh, and you're going to actually like respawn basically in that zone. Uh, and be able to immediately get a free movement and return into into combat. Uh, so it creates some really cool systems. This is a game that plays in a free for all mode and a team battle mode. So where it gets super interesting is I ran a play test last night, night with a group of people, and they were interested in, in running a two v two team battle. And so you get two very unique heroes versus two very unique heroes with different powers and abilities. And yeah. it's just wonderful to see the interplay uh, because you can do all sorts of crazy positioning thing, like put the, you know, the knight in front of uh, the caster and protect the caster or vice versa. Let the, you know, pick two fighters and just swing in on people and, you know, try to take them down. So there's a variety of different team based um, mechanics as well uh, that are really super fun uh, for for multiple board game groups. Uh, to play for everything from you know one v one to a three player free for all or even a chaotic four player free for all if you would like but um, we do think the team mm. battle is a really nice element of uh, the game okay i mean you described this obviously as a hero building battleground but um do you do you have any elements of campaign play for anyone that likes that or is it purely just combat it's, uh, it's purely just combat and, and that hero building part of it, it is in all your choices. So we do have an attribute system and that attribute system, you can see it on that um, that image you're showing right there. Um, it's closely next to the deck. You'll notice that there's a orange bar, a yellow bar, a blue bar and a red bar and a green bar. Yeah. Um, so those are uh, the yellow ones, actually the energy resource. So you can actually uh, upgrade that, but you can have more or less energy on that system. But the other two, or the other couple there, the blue uh, speed, so you can alter your character's base movement. Uh, so that comes into play whenever you take a sprint action, you're going to actually move your speed, and your character will start with their you know, starting speed. So some characters start slower, some characters start faster. And then depending on yeah. what cards you play, 
uh, because there's six cards for control, six cards for power, and six cards for growth for every hero in that 18 uh, unique uh, deck for each hero. They tie into those structural growth uh, tiers. So, you know, blue ties into speed typically. Uh, might is corresponding to yellow growth. And, um, you know, health is, is, is also involved in that system as well. So you can also train to upgrade your attributes. Sometimes your tech tree can help influence uh, which attributes you're going to be upgrading. And some of the cards you play also influence your growth as well. So there's a lot of ways that you are going to kind of create a unique story every time. Um, that's definitely what unfolds. Uh, no game is going to be the same because, you know, just depending on what cards you have, you're going to start with a starter card. So we do have a, a system where the play is structured, that you'll have a starting hand of one of each card. So you'll never get pigeonholed into one or the other per se. Um, and you can always draw more cards or, you know, learn, which is a way for you to discard cards you don't want and draw new cards. Uh, but essentially, that path that you go down and as you play, it will create a completely different built hero each time. Wow. And that's what we see from from all the playtesters we have is um, you just get a unique situation. Yeah. No, it, it sounds like it's, it's, uh, it's going to play really well. I mean, uh, obviously, we've been you know looking at some of the images on the website, which is uh, burningforge.com. Um, uh, so anyone can kind of go on here and have a, a real good look and, and sign up to your mailing list, which you've got, as well as obviously signing up to, to the pre-Kickstarter. Um, but the artwork looks looks really nice. Um, and I'm, I'm a very – Steph will, will, and, and, and Gregor, everyone knows that I'm a, a very visual person. Uh, and if it looks pretty and looks nice, uh, I, I'm, I'm there. <laughs> and, and I think that's what kind of drew, uh, drew me to, the, you. to your game <laughs> in the first place because um, you guys had put a lot – you're working with uh, Devon uh, um, on, on the one of the design groups – uh, and, and you guys posted some of the provisional graphics on the on the Facebook design group. And, and I saw it and I was just like, um, that looks really good. And there was that whole debate. Uh, actually, I wanted to talk to you about about going with standees or miniatures. <laughs> now, of course, you guys have gone towards the oh, standees. Yeah. Uh, and I, I can now visually see why, because, you know, with a very color rich board that you've got there, having a, a gray miniature would look dull and boring against it. And the fact that you've got these, these, you know, colorful art, full art, full art printed standees uh, match your board and your theme. So it makes sense. But if you could have, would have you gone down the miniature route or are you happy with mm -hmm. the standees? Oh, oh, I'll, I'll tell you the whole, the whole thing, Chris, first shout out to Devin. He's a wonderful guy. Um, I love him. He's, brilliant to work with and he's passionate about this game he's played it with me he loves it too it's in his ethos i know he's designing a fighting game on his own punch kick block so i think it was a good fit to to partner together to work on this um and you're right about, about the art uh i think when i think of fun games i think adding elements of uh visual aspects to them can only accentuate well-designed gameplay i mean ultimately the game has to play well but you know, yeah. as a consumer or someone who wants to buy games, we all want to buy beautiful games because there's something that's uh, nice about aesthetically pleasing things um, that just extend the greatness of the designer, uh, what they're trying to convey to the players and the play feel of the game. Uh, so we definitely wanted, I wanted it as something vibrant uh, and beautiful and fun, and it kind of conveys kind of a, an energy to it it's bright it's 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 vibrant um so with the standee situation uh I, it's been told to me by many 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 indie designers uh that if you're going to make your first game don't do miniatures so that's the uh the good advice that i've received from many people so in an effort to listen to their good advice uh i had thought about doing miniatures and they talked me off the ledge um but here's <laughs> the thing in in not doing miniatures I didn't want to provide cardboard standees. Not that I don't think cardboard standees are great. I wanted to provide the closest thing to a miniature that I possibly could. And so yeah. I got some quotes and looked into it and I thought, hey, these acrylic standees, you know, there's not much like you need to do. You just take them out of the box. They look great. I never paint my minis. 
Uh, I know I talked to some people on the playtesting group last night, uh, and they said, oh, yeah, I love minis, but I, I don't think I have any of mine painted. <laughs> uh, and I, I share that problem, too. I have some miniature games, and they've never been painted. Um, so what I want to deliver is, is the best value. Uh, uh, we're willing to, you know, ship this base game with the acrylic standees, no upgraded needed. That just comes with the, ga uh, the base game. Uh, so mm -hmm. there's no, you know, we get to get the deluxe version to get the acrylic standees we're just going to include those that's just something that we wanted to do um and then they're just super bright because you know uh, each character is a primary color for now i mean if we ever come out with an expansion we'll have hues that are not primary colors um but right now it's you know all the simple colors like red purple green blue uh so they all stand out they're all very unique and what's cool about the um the acrylic standees we were able to get the the name of the character on on the bottom as well for the prototype so we're going to hold to uh that for manufacturing as well so you can kind of see the name and tie it to the character and their background so that's kind of a little bit about you know how we ended up doing acrylic standees and we really hope people find them really fun they're durable they're they're shiny they have a nice glow to them um on the table so that's one of the reasons why we chose them yeah no i couldn't and that's not to say that, that if we uh, if we uh, if we overfund as well, maybe I can get STL files for miniatures made. Uh, we'll see. Um, that's all depending on how much we fund, and um, you know, anything's on the table for a more deluxified version. But we haven't. You knew exactly we haven't made any where I was going to go so with No that. promises yeah. there. Mm -hmm. I was about to say that because you know I'm, I'm one of these people that's got a a 3D printer, um, and uh, releasing STLs is. Uh, uh, something I ask on a regular basis because uh, I, I know I get the I, you know I get I, I get some of these files and I'm like I want to upscale them because I want to do a really big print. <laughs> uh, but I can see I can see that they, yeah. they look great. The I standees mean... look great. I, I, I'd like to go back to the fact that you were talking about the fact that everything's in like really bright primer colors. Um, and one of the things that the Dora of Lincoln Geek team have been finding quite recently with a lot of games that we've been asked to review or told about that are coming up is this uh, great contrast um, in brightness and visuality that's actually helping um, gamers that are either visually impaired or um, struggle with complex uh, information. Um, you've got a lot of information mm. on your character cards, but it's so clear because you've been using these bright primary colors. Was that accidental or did you design that in? Well, so, you know, it's funny about a lot of things in design is there's sort of this almost kind of intentional things that we do as designers, like, oh, we want to you know, deliver fun gameplay that's rewarding and replayable, uh, but how you go about it and what intuitive sparks you get along the way. And then all, you know, he does very bright stuff. So it kind of influenced a lot of, so I'm doing partially some of the graphic design. And then I've also had, uh, you know, great people at Art Potions take a look and, and give some some templates. I actually got to go back to them and and get things re-upgraded again. So this is still prototype. Um, the final art wow. will be even better than what you see today. But as, as you know how things work, it, it always takes so much more time to get things done. Not that the artists are slow, but me. Uh, you know, we're polishing and doing everything we can possible. I know I've been doing a lot of our graphic design uh, just because things change quite often. Like we find ways to... Uh, as we're going towards the the final polish uh, for Kickstarter, um, mm. you know, we, we really invested in uh, making sure that everything functions. But to answer your question, um, no, uh, we didn't have it like that when we first started. Um, but things evolve as we defined the relic path system and came up with the three unique paths that we are going to create for each asymmetrical hero that we want them. So control influences the board. That's their primary focus is any any of the relic paths that are in control the blue cubes allow you to better position allow you to better move allow you to throw people into encounters that are on the map or throw people into uh, hazards which deal additional damage we also have a damage preventative thing on the board called barricades which adds so blue uh, champions that invest in the blue relics can you know better optimize positioning and so 
as we created those different tiers for you know control power growth we're like okay so what are we going to color them because uh we need a unique way to visually signify that these things are completely different um and so i think we just decided primary colors because when you think about the sites and in brochures it's always primary colors every logo is a primary color typically or a variation of of such logos and then after other logos people started doing like orange just to be unique <laughs> but uh yeah so we, we defaulted to that because we know it works in other in the world and that people you know respond mentally to them and you said that part of the reason for doing primary colors as well <clears throat> excuse me was that you're looking to do maybe do other colors with dlc uh, dlc expansions and all that sort of thing um do you have any expansions planned i mean so we got we got a possibility of one in my back pocket we're still working <laughs> on um, the logistics of exactly what we want to put on the kickstarter page um me and my co-designer go back and forth on what's possible mm. We really do have um, a, a keen focus on, we don't want to water down the game. We want the core game modes to be very tight, very polished. Your experience for game modes is exceptional. Uh, and that's hard to do. That takes a lot of time. That takes a lot of play testing. Uh, we don't want to put anything out there that isn't where we want it to be. I mean, Floyd's made a bunch of games, seven plus games. And so he's experienced mm -hmm. with, you know, navigating some of those waters of, yeah, so many game modes but which ones are the good ones and players don't know which ones are the best game modes if you make seven game modes and only two of them are, are really good uh they're gonna mm. pick the one that they want to play because you've added these awesome game modes so we're really trying to keep a very keen focus on what's possible within it is a very complicated Delivery, I would say, like you don't realize how much is moving on behind the scenes in the background from a designer standpoint cards and a lot of other different things and so we have to be very careful about what we add and what we take out but i do have a possible expansion in my back pocket that may or may be on the kickstarter page when we launch on march 29th um we still have time to kind of decide if that's gonna happen uh, um and i don't want to say too much about that because then i'll get i'll get stuck uh, but we do have a potential uh solo mode and uh this is uh, one boss battle expansion, somewhat planned in the future. If it if we don't have everything in place in time for Kickstarter, I'll have to buy the expansion, <laughs> which will come out mm -hmm. probably in like another six months to a year. Um, would be when I would expect that to come out if we just can't get it designed. And, that, and that's not a bad thing, you know. If if people like the game, um, you know, that often they'll go, oh, I want the expansion. I want I want some you know different characters. And we've all done it. We've all been there. I mean, um, I'm uh, you know, one of the games that I've been playing a lot more recently. Ironically, it sat behind me, Horizon Zero Dawn, and they're bringing out all these expansions of, of, of from you know, from the game, and I'm just like, oh my god, I want it. And then you I have people it. like me, Chris, that I don't even own the base game for Horizon Zero Dawn, and I want to buy the expansions so that I can steal your copy. <laughs> yeah, and you ain't stealing my copy. It took me ages to get that. <laughs> <laughs> But no, uh, so, but I mean, obviously, you have your provisional uh, date uh, for your Kickstarter. Um, people have the ability to be able to go online uh, and uh, get an, a pre-notification uh, for that. Um, and of course, that's 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 that, that's the way the way the way it is, and it's, it's really useful for people to be able to do that. Uh, but of course, they can also check out um, a lot of your content um, that you already have uh, available on your website, which is. Uh, burningforge.com i hope i got that right yeah oh yeah well, i know you. i mean you can also <laughs> google you got it right um so you can go there uh one thing that i will shout out is we do have a very active facebook group uh and a discord um those two areas are the um the two places uh you can influence the game um so if you you know want to see some art that we're working on or you know, we, we, you know, we're naming a new me mechanism uh, that we wanted to make more thematic. Uh, we, we went and did some polls. Uh, you'll see us on um, some of the uh, uh, board game design 
and lab groups and other different board games we've been posting uh, questions and things there. So, but feel free to join our Discord or, or uh, Facebook group because you know your opinion matters. I mean, we're we're near the end of a uh, kind of design journey, and we're kind of just polishing and adding little things like items and stuff in the future. Uh, so those are areas that you can help influence the game and, and continue to add your little stamp to it. Yeah. So um, uh, that's that's really great, uh, and it's been really lovely chatting to you uh, about your game. Um, but um, I'm just going to go go around everyone here now, uh, uh, and I'm actually going to start. With, with Gregor and say, one mate, have you got any other questions? Uh, uh, and also, uh, what games have you been playing uh, over the last, you know, kind of month uh, while you while we've all been uh, kind of waiting for the live show? <laughs> well, uh, mm. my other, uh, I'll, I'll have your questions. And I feel like I don't want to say what games I'm playing because uh, we've got a post going up on the on the site on the reviews bit of the site. Tomorrow. Yes, we have. Which has all of the best games we've played in 2021 in it. Right. Uh, okay. So, all right. Then. <laughs> so, you know, you, you could, could read that. That's that's all I'm saying. Um, yeah. I'm keeping my cards close to my chest. But okay. uh, also, uh, yeah, in terms of questions, the other, I noticed when you um, when we looked at that little Kickstarter page, you've already got like 760 followers. On Kickstarter, so what? That's seven hundred and sixty people signed up, ready, waiting for this Kickstarter that doesn't even have an exact date that it goes live yet. How have you got to that many people buying into your game before there's even a date on it? Oh well, so we we we, we kind of wanted to design it as long as it needed to be designed. Uh, so that's kind of hard to do um, when you are build, building a game. Uh, because you can launch too early. Um, and we were definitely worried about if we launched too early before all the pieces of the puzzle had been solved, we wouldn't be able to deliver a game that would be very excited and, and you know, the quality wouldn't be there. So, you know, we'd ne never put a date on the campaign page so that we would have some flexibility. Uh, but we reached a point recently where we can actually give a date to expect it, March 20. 9th, uh, the last Tuesday in March is when we're expected to go live. Uh, we'll have review copies out. Um, so there'll be some reviews ready to go for when we launch. Uh, and we're, we're in the process now of basically doing uh, kind of like playtesting uh, around polishing. So just really yeah. narrowing down just very small wordings on 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 cards we're submitting all the files to an editor you know they just tore apart my uh, my rule book that had been in the rule book exchange like four times uh, so you can really see the difference between skill sets when you hire a professional editor versus you know working with other game designers on writing rule books they're still really good and uh, we spent I don't know how many hours I spent maybe like 40 50 hours writing this rule book uh, and get it to an editor in some parts he he did didn't make any changes on but there was a sea of red of just optimized words meaning like everything was just yeah. so much more concise <laughs> he cut all my fluff words the wording was less ambiguous uh so it's things like that that we're doing in the background to really just make sure that when we get to launch everything's done um so we have a date uh, you know, we started uh, bringing on a lot of team members like that editor and, and Devin and a few other people who are all also helping us just with polish and things here and there uh, so that we can really, you know, deliver on our pledge of, you know, getting a really fun game that's uh, going to last for a while onto your shelves. Mm. Fantastic. Cool. Steph, have you got anything? Um, I'm kind of going to go a little bit with Gregor and sort of say, like, we do have a post coming out about all of the great games we've been playing in 2021. Uh, I am, however, going to sort of focus a little bit on some of the RPGs. So for those of you that do read the reviews, and thank you so much for the excellent support over the last year, um, I'm a huge, huge RPG person. Um, in COVID, finding people to play RPGs with um, or, or finding a platform of RPG that works online as well as um, in person has been quite difficult. But the last year has been amazing. So we've recently had Apex Astounding Thrills, um, which is a diesel punk. And that's been just fantastic. It's Indiana Jones meets Jurassic Park. My mind was blown. It was fantastic. Um, and my absolute favorite, which was a bit of um, uh, a shocker, actually, was Partners. 
Oh my gosh, it was, it's a two player RPG. Um, it's um, really well written. All you need is a deck of cards to help you work it out. Even you as the player don't know who the bad guy is until the very end when you turn the playing card over and you look up like how it all works. But I found that the RPG crowd have started to get to realize that you can't have huge gaming groups um, now. Uh, with COVID, um, so they've gone smaller. Some of them have gone um, solo. So there's um, one RPG that's coming out uh, this year called Secrets of the Vibrant Isle, and that's a solo RPG, which I'm so, like, I can't wait uh, for that to come out and see how that works. Um, so, yeah, so, like, although I'm not going to go into, like, huge detail of the, the rest of the board games, like the RPG um, crowd this time around has just been absolutely phenomenal. Really has. Um, in terms of like questions for Stephen, I think I'm all I'm all good for questions. So you've been like really genuinely lovely uh, and answered everything. Um, so oh, thank, thank you. you so much for coming on the show and been talking Steph. to us. Yeah, I mean, appreciate I, it, Steph. I, I mean, my, my final question is. Um, uh, uh, and I know the answer to it, but I'm going to lead it into you because I'm sure you 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 found it extremely useful. Yeah. But you have a tabletop simulator version of this, don't you? Mm -hmm. I do. We do have a version of it. Yeah, it's available uh, online. Um, so if you go to tabletop simulator and workshop, you can find it. Just look up the keyword slash. And in slash and spells, and you'll actually find it. It's one of the top ones there. You can get it, get to it through your your website as well, can't you? Yes. So I think I've uh, attached the link there onto the website so that you can find it that way as well, just making it easier for people to track it down. Yeah, there it is, uh, and it looks lovely as well. Um, uh, I'm not going to fire up my tabletop simulator because it will kill my editing PC. Um, it, I've not got a GPU in this. Yeah, um, that's what I thought too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's there available for anyone who wants to go on and have a play test uh, and, and uh, give any feedback while the you know, guys are still doing uh, your development because um, I'm definitely going to be checking it out. Uh, we're going to be doing a review as well. Um, uh, but one of the things that I was going to mention um, is um, that, of course, while I've not got any questions for, you, for yourself anymore, um, the game I've been playing, um, you know, I'm kind of up on the shelf is behind it, me. Is it <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I really like it. It's good. Um, it just matches <laughs> really in it. So, uh, um, yeah, but there'll be a review coming that on the website soon. So I'm not going to go into to that into, into that too much. Um, but um, it's been absolutely phenomenal. Like Steph said, having you on the show, it's been a really nice chat. Uh, I really enjoyed having you on the show. Um, have you got any questions for us? And what have you been playing that's not been your game? Oh, okay. All right. So let's start with you guys though first. Um, so um what's your favorite style of game if you had to pick one style of game i heard rpgs from steph but i know maybe you want to pick a different one but uh or you can pick that one just favorite style of game i'm curious just to survey the room kind of get a okay. feel for you guys mine's a deck builder i like a good deck builder very cool um hmm, difficult they're awesome uh, Say that, like, yeah, I don't know. I quite like games where you can create your own things, so like tile placement games and stuff that allows you to build a new sort of world every time. I guess that's not really a genre, and not really an answer. No, it kind um, of is. World well, builder. I quite. That's like a good that. answer. Yeah, yeah, got well, a new I quite theme. like the casual world builder. Yeah, yeah. yeah. De definitely yeah. RPG. It tells me, me a lot um, about like I'm an, what, I'm what you like to play. Writer, so that really, I find RPGs. If I'm not playing Ooh. them for the entertainment value with friends, I can even like write novels and stories based around those campaigns. So it, it kills like so many little hobby spots for me. Um, but no, I'm I'm a huge, huge RPG <laughs> fan. So yeah. All right. And uh, and and what, and what have you been playing that's not that's your own awesome. game? Then anything cool? 
Uh, uh, yeah. So um, shout out to another indie designer, uh, Galen. Uh, he's working on Super Snipers. Uh, and it's really cool. Uh, so it's a two-player dueling snipers game uh, in which you play, you know, different asymmetric heroes. And it's got this really wonderful polyomino-based kind of Tetris style to it, but in a sniper game. So you wouldn't think that those two would work, but they do. Because each uh, oh, wow. polyomino is like breath, focus, uh, and then something else I forget off the top of my head. But it's really fun. Um, and it's kind of like a really great back and forth kind of, I would say mildly stress inducing because, uh, that Tetris, you know, timeline and trying to get everything in play so that you can take out your opponent and discover where they are on the map is really well done. I mean, he's a great guy and, uh, he's been supportive of my campaign. Uh, and also just in general, you know, we, we, we work with each other to try to make, make our designs better. I mean, you know, his, his design is like almost ready in my opinion uh i think he's planning a kickstarter for this year but near the end of it uh so people should check that out as well just because it's a great game mm. all right so I'll check that out thank you very much it's that's really interesting i've not heard of that one so i'll keep an eye out for that um yeah well look you know we're, we're coming up to the end of the show um uh, and uh, we're just going to do uh, a couple of little things just to, to let people know what's going on over the coming months so uh, Let's Talk Board Games is proving very popular. Um, uh, we are already booking up uh, guests for the rest of the year. It's crazy. Uh, so uh, next month, uh, 3rd of February, as you can see on screen right now, uh, we've got Pencil First Games and Eduardo Baraf coming on the show. Um, so if you've uh, heard of Cascadia, uh, he has any more involvement in that, uh, along with some other amazing titles. Um, so, you know, hopefully come along and join us for that. Uh, in March, we've got Zebrafish Games, uh, Chris and your friend Devon, and I'm, I'm my friend Devon. <laughs> uh, he's they're going to be on the show talking about <laughs> what they're doing uh, with Zebrafish. Um, in April, I have had just confirmation that we're going to be having Jonathan Gilmore on the show, uh, games designer of uh, uh, Dead of Winter. Uh, he'll be coming on the show and talking to us about his experience in the board games industry. He's done lots of other great titles, but we're avid fans of Dead, Dead of Winter. Uh, we even actually, I think, if I remember correctly, opened that with our 24-hour live stream for uh, uh, cancer research uh, by playing that on Tabletop Simulator. So, uh, yeah, it's a favorite of ours. Um, and then in May, we've got uh, the Stone Sword um, guys coming back giving us an update on where they are with Senjutsu, their samurai dueling card game. So, and George uh, all over that. Yes, yes, George is very mm -hmm. excited um, to, to have the guys back on the show. Um, he's not made it at all clear that he loves the game. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, um, lots of things going on. And, of course, we've also got some great podcast episodes coming up as well. So for uh, any of you that also you know, isn't aware, we also have our podcast, which is Get Your Geek On with the podcast of A Lincoln Geek. Uh, ed our podcast editor-in-chief, Gregor, down at the bottom there, is uh, working away really hard on some great new episodes that are coming up. Um, there you go. Is it, there, there they are on screen. Get it on Spotify. Yes, you can get it on Spotify. <laughs> you can get it on um, uh, Amazon as well as um, uh, Apple Podcasts as well. We are all over the place. Uh, and if you uh, use Anchor as well, you can listen to it on there as well. There's lots of different platforms you can listen to it. It's great. Um, uh, and, of course, we're going to have some amazing articles uh, coming out in the coming months as well. So uh, if you aren't a subscriber and you are stumbling across our stream, uh, do subscribe, like, follow, share, because without you lovely people out there, we, we don't grow. And uh, we want to. Um, we're going to be coming to you later on in the year, again, from UK Games Expo, um, with lots of great exclusives. So um, watch this space and, and do, you know, keep us in the loop. Uh, and again, so I want to say thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, Stephen Schwartz, um, uh, for coming oh, on the show you and talking about your game um keep us in the loop let us know how things go um and uh we, you know maybe you know get you back on the show or on the podcast in future oh it'd be excellent 
yeah. pleasure to speak with. Well, Thank you so much for all yeah. your, your excellent questions. Yeah, brilliant. All right, guys. Well, look, it's a, a bye from me. And take care, stay safe, and keep gaming, everyone. Bye, everyone.